Hello and good evening. Welcome to the Bristol University Alumni Festival. I'm Katia Adler. I'm the BBC's uh, Europe Editor. I graduated from Bristol University uh, with a BA Joint Honours a million years ago, it feels like, um, back in uh, 1995. Um, but it's not about me tonight. It's about the fabulous um, uh, alumni um, award winners. Um, before we start, though, you'll notice on the right hand side uh, of your screen, um, there are poll and chat panels. You can send in your comments uh, throughout this evening's event. You can send us questions um, that you have for our illustrious guest uh, this evening. We'll be coming to Q&A uh, in about 45 minutes time. Um, and also we have a poll question that we would really like you uh, to answer. So the question is, um, what is it that you most associate uh, your time at Bristol with? Was it your course? Was it societies? Was it sports? Or perhaps was it the city yourself? Do answer that question and we'll get back to the result of the poll uh, right at the end. Now, the Alumni Festival is all about Bristol University commemorating the 2021 Alumni Award winners and the amazing ways in which they've transformed uh, the communities around them. It's also uh, time for a bit of a candid chat uh, with the seven winners, uh, their ups and downs in their career, uh, their favourite moments and possibly some uh, embarrassing moments uh, as well. Definitely a lot of anecdotes. Today, I'm delighted to say that uh, we're joined by Dr Jackie Cornish. Um, she's the win winner of the Alumni Award for Community Impact. Congratulations, uh, Jackie. Uh, so so well deserved. Jackie's one of the NHS's most influential paediatricians and she's recently been appointed a university pro-chancellor so congratulations uh, on that as well. So Jackie spent 40 years um, working frontline with paediatric hematological malignancy, 20 years of NHS medical management as she has under her glamorous belt uh, and then a uh, Dr. Dr. Jackie Cornish was appointed National Clinical Director for Children and Young People in NHS England. And there, uh, she had a responsibility for all children of all ages with all conditions, mental and physical health, from the sick premature neonatal uh, to transition to adulthood. Um, Jackie really is a trailblazer in her field. She has a lifelong commitment to improving mental and physical health in children and young people. She has transformed clinical practice and care uh, in this country. And because of that, back in 2003, Jackie was awarded an OBE for her services to pediatrics. She continues to work tirelessly with communities uh, in Bristol. So this is an impact um, on the close community, but actually you know, on the whole country. Now, before we get to speak uh, to Jackie, and there is a lot to talk about, um, we're going to hear from another pioneer, that's Ria Singhal. She's the Alumni Award winner for sustainability, and she runs India's first and largest sustainable food packaging company, uh, EcoWare. Let's have a look. Connection to me means to be open, to be available, or even vulnerable to another person. It's an exchange of energy between people, uh, and it has the power to deepen the relationship, inspire change, and build trust. I would tell myself uh, not to take myself so seriously. The thing that works really well for me is just exercise, going for a run, working out. Um, it helps me think differently. How else will you learn? You have to be resilient and adversity is a part of life. I miss the simplicity of it all. It was just me. It was my choices, what I wanted to do. Um, it, was, it was a simple time. I am honestly overwhelmingly honored to receive this award um, and to be recognized for my work. It was the courage that I got from my family to sort of steer away from my comfort zone and just take that leap of faith. I think that ultimately, if there's something you want to do, just go out and do it. What motivates me is when I see how impactful the work that we do is. Ultimately, we want to improve livelihood and the state of the planet, and I am proud to be a part of the solution and not the problem. 
a big congratulations, Ria Sengal, and um, and absolutely take that leap of faith. You are an amazing example. So congratulations again on your uh, award. And Bristol University is is proud that it has alumni really all over the world in 190 countries. Um, and the fact that we're online has yeah, absolutely, it's downsides. Plus sides is that we're joined this evening uh, by many people from all over the world. So again, a very warm welcome. And now we get to what you're really here for tonight, which is our chat with Dr. Jackie Cornish. Jackie, first of all, again, a huge congratulations um, on your very well-deserved award. Thank you very much indeed. It's a huge honor and I can't tell you, I'm delighted to receive it. Um, and you're wearing pink for the occasion, which is something we're going to get to uh, uh, at the end of, of our chat, um, I, I think. But um, let's delve into your career, a really illustrious career. So in really, really sincerely impressive. Um, I think, you know, you can sort of divide it up, though, into sort of three overall chapters, wouldn't you say? Yes, yes, no, absolutely. And, uh, and those three chapters, really, the first one is is working with childhood high-risk leukaemia and developing the stem cell transplant unit at Bristol Children's Hospital, which was a huge challenge and a fantastic ability, really, to deliver care to children, which if they hadn't had, they wouldn't have survived. So that was tremendously important. And I think you know, this picture here shows you some of the patients who we successfully transplanted some of them from sibling donors, and then really our most successful program, which was developing unrelated donors to use in transplant in the instances where any child didn't have a brother or sister who matched. And there's a one in four chance that any sibling will match another. So that left three quarters of our patients without donors. So in a very pioneering way, we developed, we were the first in the country for children to develop this, this potentially very toxic and potentially harmful procedure for children. But intrepidly, we went on our way and it was fabulous. It developed and it grew. And the picture in the middle is you can see me presenting a certificate to a little boy called Keen Myers. And he was our 500th unrelated donor transplant recipient. And that was just so exciting. Another particularly exciting event is, is sort of bottom left. You can see a picture of a, a young lady looking justifiably very pleased with herself. Um, she had had a transplant for acute leukaemia in our unit. And a few years following that, she entered into the University of Bristol Medical School and she qualified as a doctor. So absolutely fabulous. There have been some huge successes, great challenges, because so often, particularly European colleagues used to say to me at meetings, and I remember a lady, a very scary lady called Professor Eliane Gluckman from the Hospital Saint Louis in Paris, who said to me, my dear, when you first presented your data, we didn't believe you, but after a while we did. And I thought, you know, I had to run the gauntlet of all of that before it finally was accepted and it became a major therapy for children with high risk leukemia and various other diseases. Can I just ask you, Jackie, before we move on to, to chapter two uh, in your career, as you say, you know, this this treatment, it was pioneering, potentially dangerous. Did you, never mind colleagues uh, or peers, did you ever doubt yourself? Um, I suppose, I suppose we rather than doubted, we were we were anxious. I can remember the first unrelated donor transplant we did when the marrow arrived and the trick about unrelated donor transplant is to remove what we call T cells from the from the donor marrow, because these are the ones who, when they get into the patient, can cause a really big problem with graft versus host disease, which can be lethal. So we sat there, all, all colleagues, and we watched this go in drip by drip, keeping our fingers crossed that there wouldn't be an initial poor reaction. And then, of course, tantalizingly waiting until that marrow safely engrafted in the patient who'd been heavily pretreated with high doses of chemotherapy and radiation. Then we got to engraftment and the graft had to stick. And from that point, we realized that probably it was a success. But yes, of course, we, we embarked on this with trepidation, but sincere in the, in the sort of belief that we had to do something for three quarters of our patients who lapsed, a sing who didn't have a, a sibling donor and who would otherwise have died had we not done something to help and support them. 
So you then your comes chapter two, which is a mixture of frontline, which you'd frontline work, which you'd got used to, of course, already, um, and politics. How did that mix go in NHS England? Oh, well, quite fascinating, really, because actually, you know, doctors join and do medicine because they want to do medicine. They don't want to enter politics. But actually, the advantage to having clinicians in medicine is that you are the ultimate advocate for your patient group because you know exactly what they want and you know exactly what facilities should be provided for them. And while I was doing certainly medical management in University Hospitals Bristol, where I started as sort of clinical director for my own services of oncology, haematology and BMT, then I moved up to be clinical director of the Children's Hospital. And then I moved to be head of division of women's and children's services, which was an absolutely colossal job. It was huge. I had two and a half thousand staff um, in the division. Um, no, I don't think that's quite time for that slide. Um, I had um, more than 30 services. I had, oh goodness, an awful lot of a huge budget, a hundred million budget to, to look after. And it was really an enormous responsibility to sit alongside my, my clinical job because, of course, I was still doing that. It was, it was fun. It was challenging and testing because I had an awful lot of targets to meet and that, that's what the NHS was all about. But I had to deliver care safely with good patient and, um, and staff experience increasing quality and making sure that we deliver the best outcomes. And the trick here was to bring it in in budget. I had a budget of 100 million and I have to say that I failed so many times and I was overspent almost the entire time. But, you know, I she I says never proudly, <laughs> of course, well, you want <laughs> to look that... after the patients. Right? Yeah. Well, you know, if, if the patients need more nursing staff, then actually you go out and get them. If, if I get sort of, you know, thumped on the back by the sort of financial director, which I did regularly. In fact, when I first took over as head of division, after two days, he came over and this was, he's, he's a bit of a chauvinist, but he's a fantastic financial director. He put his arm across my shoulders. He said, now, my dear, and I find, don't you find it's shockingly patronising when somebody says, my dear. He said, now, my dear, what are you going to do about your two million overspend? And I said, look, Paul, I'm a big spender, but even I can't manage to be two million pounds overspent in two days. And of course, it was a, an entire deficit that I'd inherited when I came into the post. But no, it was it was tough. But I was committed to doing it because actually what I really learned was that the synergy between clinicians and and properly well-trained uh, medical managers or, or managers was actually that together you could achieve greater outcomes than if you did it separately. And when I used to sort of see all new consultants when they came first to the hospital, and they used to sit in front of me in my office and say, oh, I'm never going to do medical management. And I said to them, yes, you are. And the reason you are is because you care about your patients and you care about the very best outcomes. So you will do medical management. So that was my first fray, well, 20 years worth into med management locally before I went off to um, the big, big management job. NHS England, exactly. And I think you're you're unpacking this for us as, as you speak that, of course, we're here tonight to, to celebrate your successes and to hear some of the stories and behind it. But what you're showing us already is the huge challenges uh, that you faced along the way, whether it was in frontline medicine, uh, then in medical management, and then to NHS England. I mean, where do we start responsible for so many newborns, children and young people for the whole country? That itself is a challenge. Is, is there something that particularly stands out for you, though, as like your ultimate challenge during that time? <sighs> Goodness me, I, I think that the, the biggest challenge was that as I arrived and I felt a bit like sort of, you know, that lovely picture of Alice in Wonderland greeting the dodo, I thought this is something which is absolutely huge, but they've appointed me to this post. So naturally, they clearly want a national director for children. I then found that actually NHS England at that point were barely interested in children and young people at all. And that was the challenge throughout my entire sort of six and a half, almost seven years with NHS England, is, is to actually convince them 
not that you should have to, that children and young people really, really mattered. So I was not only the advisor to NHS England on all of those, as you described, the wide sort of specialties, but also to the Department of Health and Social Care. And that was interesting as well, because at the Health and Social Care Act at 2012, all the national directors were ripped out of the Department of Health to actually sit in the newly created arm's length body of NHS England, as were all the other arm's length bodies, Public Health England, Health Education, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But that left the Department of Health with no in-house clinical advice. So I sat in this very difficult balance, and I think we have got a balance picture there somewhere, that's right, between two characters you will immediately recognise. Uh, one of them was Jeremy Hunt, who was the Secretary of State for Health for the entire time. I was at uh, almost, apart from the last few, few months at NHS England. And then the other side of that balance was now um, Sir Simon Stevens, who arrived as um, Chief Executive of NHS England a year after I arrived. And that was a really, really difficult balance because politically, you were actually sort of walking a tightrope. Once Simon Stevens arrived, he issued an edict to all national clinical directors that any time we saw a minister, any time we gave a presentation in public, the presentation and the notification had to go through his office first. So in effect, really senior clinicians had to have their homework marked. That was a complete nightmare. And I, you know, in the end, I sort of had some very good advice because I used to go to um, Jeremy Hunt's care meetings, which, which happened every Monday with a cast of thousand. And inevitably, the presentation I was going to give had been doctored a bit. I used to get furious about this, but I decided the way to cope with it was get into the room, cast of thousands, civil servants, NHS people, health education, everybody, and then actually just give my message face to face, say what I wanted to say, usually in the first two sentences so that I didn't lose their attention. In other words, get the salient points of what I wanted to say really quickly. There were so many things to talk about. You know, how can you pull out from that vast array of what you had to do, um, what I wanted to talk about? But there was one very, very, very big issue. And that was what had happened to infant and child mortality in this country over 25 years, when actually our position, now you see it on the screen now, had slipped horrifically, such that whereas we started within Europe at about fifth or sixth position, we dropped over 25 years to be somewhere close to the bottom. And that was horrific, really. Nobody in this country would believe it. But it's true. And, and there, are, there are many reasons for that. But actually, it was clear that we had to do something about that. And, and that's why I set about, and this took, this is a major challenge, this took many, many years, because in fact, you know, social inequalities play a sort of a huge role in almost all causes of, of child death. So social inequality and deprivation are big things. Now, we in health couldn't do too much about that, apart from point it out. But almost 4,000 children a year die in, in England, 60% of them in infancy and 70% of those in the first month of life. Most of them die in hospital, but 30% of them have what we call modifiable factors, so something we can do something about. But at that stage, so in early on in my career with NHS England in about 2014 or so, I tried to get NHS England interested in setting up a national child mortality database because we didn't have one. We didn't have granular data. We didn't have the capability to scrutinize each child death to see why they had died. So that was the start of a, of a long struggle. I managed to get funding to support a pilot to see if this would work. The pilot delivered in 2015, and yes, it would work. So I then persuaded NHS England with the help of colleagues to actually give a million pounds to this project, which would see it set up and keep it running for the first four years, which is what we did. At the same time, we were able to change legislation. And that was very exciting too, because there was ridiculously, child deaths were overviewed at that point in the Department for Education. And I think it was in 2016 that David Cameron asked uh, Alan 
Wood, who is a director of children's services, I think in Croydon community, if he would do a review of local children's safeguarding boards. So he did that and he interviewed many of us, by which time I had started looking at the National Child Death Database. And he came to many conclusions about this. The first of all, that child death scrutiny should absolutely come out of the Department for Education and into the Department for Health, which finally in 2018 it did. And he also recommended the setting up of a database, which would give us the sort of data, not only on, you know, the sort of most important things like sort of why the child died, but actually the, the socioeconomic and the health factors. And we would get active learning through looking at these modifiable factors. So this database, finally, we awarded, and this is another big plus for Bristol, we awarded the contract for the database to the University of Bristol, which is fabulous because they were definitely the best presenters and had the best bid. That database is up and running. And actually, their first publication was last week which was just so exciting and it proved what we have seen previously. It demonstrated a very clear association between child death and the level of deprivation. In other words, when children are living in a higher level of deprivation, you get a higher instance of child death. So a very, very important first work and really very exciting to have instigated that programme of work, which is now beginning to take, pay dividends it's also, I have to say, been very, very helpful during COVID. So, you know, it's um, it's wonderful, really. It's one of the more most exciting things I, I actually did within NHS England, although with all of those things, all physical health, mental health, premature babies, intensive care, long-term conditions, masses and masses and masses to get your teeth into, and all of it with support from fantastic colleagues throughout the entire country. I mean, I had a I had a little black book which I brought into play so many times and phoned a friend, particularly over parliamentary questions, which used to come in from the Department of Health on a Friday afternoon with a rapid turnaround because the Secretary of State wanted to know by a couple of hours later. So, you know, that required knowledge about everything, which of course I don't have. So so I was able to phone a friend and build up that bank of knowledge. So we'll be coming to your phone of friends a little bit later. We'll be discussing mental health um, as well. But let's concentrate not just on the challenges, but really let's wallow a little bit, Jackie, in your successes. Come on. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, one of just just to move to something, uh, you know, on, on a more personal front for you, a challenge and a success was actually getting into Bristol to to to, to study medicine at the time, wasn't it? <laughs> It certainly was, my goodness. Yes, I I decided from a very early age I wanted to do medicine. God knows why, because I came from a naval family and, you know, there's no medicine in our family at all. But um, I wanted to go to Bristol, had an excellent reputation. I applied to Bristol and they asked me to achieve four A-levels at a pretty high grade. And my headmistress, because I was convent educated, was absolutely furious about this and wrote to Bristol sort of um, student entry. And they were totally unrepentant, came back and said, well, she's taking those four A-levels, so we expect her to achieve them all at a very high grade. This was at a time they were asking boys for three Cs. I'm not sure if they were interested in whether they played rugby or not, but, you know, they that was the standard for boys, whereas I was asked to achieve more to actually get in. And that was the first year that the University of Bristol increased their female intake, and they thought they were being tremendously avant-garde to increase it to 20% of the year. So there were 20 of us girls let loose on the medical school when we finally started. And it was outrageous fun, I have to say. I loved every minute of it, apart from the fact it was just like being at school. It was nine to five all day, every day. And all our students in the Hall of Residence, all our mates were having a couple of lectures a week. It didn't quite seem fair, but, you know, that's what medicine was all about. And just briefly, because we're hoping that everyone watching today is going to um, fill out uh, that questionnaire, you know, the poll and take part. What's the most memorable uh, part of, of their studies at Bristol? What what would you say? Was it the studies themselves or should I call them extracurricular activities or the city or what was it for you? Well, it, well, having come to Bristol, it rained every day for six weeks. And I thought, oh, my God, what a terrible place to come to. But actually, I sort of got over that. I was in Hall of Residence. I was in Manor Hall, which is absolutely fabulous because I made so many friends there but that was run very much like a boarding school as well I remember the wonderful Dr Tate um, used to sit in her office every night after her supper and one has to 
go and ask her for a late pass to go out that night if you wanted to. And as for going home for a weekend, well, she wasn't too keen that you did that because, of course, she wanted you to actually merge into Bristol and become part of the sort of general scenery. So, so, so that was fascinating, really. But, you know, in Freshers Week, A, I met one of my very closest friends who, you know, remained friends with me forever. And we were so similar. Um, she was half Mediterranean, just like me. So I'm half Maltese. She was half Italian. We were both convent educated. We both were sort of, I, I guess, a bit frivolous. And, and we really wouldn't go out in the morning until we'd had our makeup and mascara on. And that meant that quite often we were late. And I always used to creep into the sort of major lecture theatre, was it E49 or something like that, um, in the medical school at the back. The two of us would just creep in into the last two seats and always imagine that we were completely invisible from the front. Of course, we weren't, because many, many, many years later, when I lectured in that lecture theatre, you've got full vision of everybody coming in. So, 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 so no, so, so, so that was good fun. But I mean, you know, living in Hall was great fun. Getting out and about in Bristol was lovely. And Bristol was a was a fabulous city, of, is a fabulous city. Of course, it's changed and it's developed now and there's a lot more. But, but we made our activities and we enjoyed being there. We enjoyed easy access to the West Country. We enjoyed easy access back to London. You know, Bristol seemed the complete place to be. And it's remained your place to be in, in so many ways. Um largely throughout throughout your career in one way or another yes it, it has i had a sort of couple of forays away from here and then came back again and i was at the point of going again when i uh in the bri bar actually met my husband or who was going to be my husband then we took an immediate dislike to each other um, because i thought who on earth is this person sitting in a pinstripe suit in the bri bar and he took an immediate dislike to me who's this person flashing her white coat around looking very snooty uh, after that sort of great beginning, we got on famously. And um, so I didn't set off for South Africa or wherever I was going to go. I actually stayed and we got married. And uh, then apart from a few sort of comings and goings of developing my career, have stayed largely in Bristol, uh, which is great because for both of us, for my husband working with Rolls-Royce and, and for me in medicine, it was a really good jumping off point. You know, we travelled both of us independently extensively from here you know, him to his international marketing, me to my conferences and things like that. Bristol has been a fabulous base for us to be, have our children, bring up the children and actually um, maintain our careers as well. I wouldn't say it was and that And I can't easy. believe you, <laughs> not, not that easy, which bit, the, the juggling the work-life balance, your massive career, the, you know, all, all lots and lots I mean, of challenges. All of it. I, I can't believe, though, actually, I will not accept, I'm sorry, the word frivolous in association with your good self. There is nothing frivolous uh, about all of your achievement and also the passion that you have when you talk about the well-being of, of, of children. Is, there's absolutely nothing frivolous about that. Hence your OBE, right, in 2003 and recognition of, of the service that, that you provide. Yes. Yes, that's right. And, and that was a really fabulous moment and absolutely super that I could take both boys. You see standing there looking extremely uncomfortable <laughs> beside me. But yes, that was a lovely, lovely moment. And and we cherished it. It was it was it was a huge achievement and, and it was a great thing to do. And then a few years later, I was invited um, to have lunch with the Queen, um, which was absolutely fantastic. I had no idea why. But it was a wonderful event. Uh, there were there was the Queen and Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, um, senior member of the um, armed forces and one of the other members from sort of one of the other branches of the royal family. And then eight guests, all of us obviously handpicked for some reason. And like so many things that are British, dare I say, it worked like clockwork. We were all moved around talking to First Her Majesty the Queen, then Prince Philip, then everybody else. It, it just worked perfectly and it was so exciting. Of course, deciding what to wear there was a complete nightmare. And up until the very last morning, I had three outfits with me and just sat to go sort of eeny, meeny, miny, moe in the end, according to weather or whatever. But, you know, chaps don't have to worry about that, do they? They all pink? Uh, uh, yes. All three <laughs> outfits? Yes. 
Jackie told me yes. just previously when we were chatting about about your love of pink. That's that's why I keep men mentioning it. And I know that is frivolous. So so do forgive me. Something that's absolutely not frivolous is you, you touched on a bit earlier, mental health. Now, um, back when you started your time at NHS England 2003, mental health wasn't kind of the words on the lips of everybody as much as it is today and arguably so much more could still be done um did yes. you have a struggle sort of promoting mental health um at, sort of equally to, to physical well-being well by the time i got to nhs england things were starting to move a little bit but actually what people don't realize is that actually sort of mental health problems are the biggest problems that children and young people face so for example you know the incidence per year of children with cancer or leukemia in total is about 1500 the incidence of young people having mental health problems in this country is over a million and that is absolutely huge and the really difficult thing about this is through health, we only access about a quarter to a third of these. So where are all the rest of this big volume of children? They're actually in schools. Now, when I started, yes, there were programmes. I used to chair programmes, the children and young people's increasing access to psychological therapies. I mean, one has to say, I am not a mental health professional, but what I am is somebody who has an incredible passion for making things better for children and young people. While I was at NHS England, there was a lot of policy which started developing, which was fantastic, and it was wonderful to be involved with it. And the first bit of policy was, um, I don't know if you remember, when Norman Lamb was a coalition health minister, and he was tremendously keen on making improvements in child mental health. And he had a very, very personal reason for wanting to do so, as well as being a health minister, and that he had two boys and his eldest son, Archie, and he's written about this extensively, suffered from obsess obsessive compulsive disorder. And, and therefore, he understood the impact that this had on a family. And so he set about doing this big exercise, which we... Um, worked on very hard and I chaired one of the subgroups in it and then finally published this wonderful document called Future in Mind, which was fantastic in that it had 45 recommendations, which is really quite a lot. But basically it was all about promoting resilience and prevention and early intervention in children with mental health problems, improving access to whatever support that we had developing accountability and transparency, and actually caring for the most vulnerable and developing the workforce because the workforce is still not enough to actually cope with the demand that we have. So Paul Farmer, who was the chief executive, still is chief executive of the charity Mind, incorporated all these 45 recommendations into the NHS five year forward view, which was absolutely wonderful really fantastic so that was a good a good beginning but the next most important thing to happen was that in fact under Theresa May we had a government green paper there again about child mental health and the important thing about this is it brought a lot of extra funding with it so that funding could be spread out towards the community to the clinical commissioning groups all of them to develop their transformation plans to improve children's outcomes access to therapies and to monitor what was actually happening and that had to happen in every single ccg throughout the whole of the country they had to submit their plans to the nhs and they had to submit data on what was happening every year so that was fantastic and then of course it all got enshrined in the um the long-term plan the nhs long-term plan and we got you know we got a lot more in that uh, services and this is something that norman lamb had been very keen on we had services for mental health from naught to 25 and that's important because as norman lamb described it 18 is like falling off a cliff you've stopped being looked after by children's services and then you don't get picked up by adult services. And it was the most awful gap in these young people's lives. And so many of them were lost to care and follow up. So now we have care designated, in fact, for all children from naught to 25. And that was a fantastic achievement. Worked hard to get that one and it worked, which was just great.
So really excited about that. So rather closer to the 25 than the naught, uh, young people make their way to the University of Bristol, um, which is a university that in recent years has been concentrating very much uh, on ensuring the mental health uh, of students and also in the wider community. You're, you're also very much involved in that effort. Yes, so so I'm involved, you know, as I said, that there's a lot of children within all of our schools throughout the country who suffer mental health problems. So I sit on the board of about 12 schools and introduced um, various sort of therapies into all of our schools, which is fantastic, working with Bristol City Council. I then worked with the university and helped them to develop a mental health strategy for pupils and for staff. And then last year, in supposedly my first year of retirement, I became president of a Care of the Elderly Society, um, which is, you know, elderly are not dissimilar to children. It's the same holistic, family-centred, community-based care. It's just that certainly within COVID, the old people became even more vulnerable and their loneliness translated into severe depression. So all the things we were able to do, these pictures are actually taken before lockdown, and you can see the benefits of bringing young, young children and older people together are just so fabulous. Each one benefits from communication with the other. But during the past year of lockdown, helping old people in all the ways that the charities and organisations we supported in our charity to do that has been wonderful and has been a lifesaver for so many old people in Bristol. It's just a, it was a really exciting thing to do. And as you mentioned COVID there, of course, COVID um, has had a well-known um, a drastic impact on uh, mental health and mental well-being, of course, um, through, throughout the country. I just wonder, I mean, we've um, chatted about so many incredible moments in your career. But, and I have to say briefly, I'm afraid, because we do want to get to some uh, of those questions that are coming in from you, from people who are watching, even though I'd love to keep you to myself for a lot longer. Um, highlights, career highlights, could you pick three, do you think? Oh gosh, yes. Okay, so very quickly, one of them when Professor Sir Liam Donaldson came down to visit the unit, and this was particularly important because Liam Donaldson and I trained together in Bristol. So I've known Liam since we were 18. And he came down as part of the Darcy Review of Excellence of Healthcare and designated our unit in Bristol, so proud of this, as a unit of quality and excellence. And you can see there all of the children who came up to meet him that day. There are two at the back. One of them qualified as a junior doctor in Bristol and now is a consultant anaesthetist. The other one beside him, he's doing biomedical science. The little chap in the middle wants to be a doctor, but he's still not quite got there. That little girl just beside Liam with the blue um, pinafore dress on was the most mismatched transplant I have ever done. She had what we call a cord blood transplant from the Japanese cord blood bank and she was a five antigen mismatch, huge. But there she is to tell the tale. So that was really exciting, fantastic highlight. Second highlight, I think might come up now. This is an example of girl power. Yes, absolutely. This was actually my 60th birthday celebration that the hospital, uh, children's hospital, put on for me. And all those ladies there are all um, specialists in childhood cancer and leukemia. One of them on the extreme left um, organises uh, cancer treatment for Scotland, the one on the extreme right for Wales, Great Ormond Street, Leeds, and there we all were having a lovely time and just sort of, you know, celebrating our friendship and our camaraderie and sharing the problems we'd shared over the years and very, very special. And I still remain very close friends to all of them. And then I guess another highlight was in 2015 when my European colleagues and I worked very closely with stem cell transplant with European colleagues, we formed there again against heavy opposition from the adult group a paediatric diseases working party and they didn't they really didn't want paediatrics to split off from adults for the simple reason and this is ridiculous isn't it is our outcomes were better and therefore when you did the sort of results the whole thing looked much better but no we won we took them out and my lovely colleagues in 2015 held a fesh shrift for me when they were very sweetly celebrating a few achievements I'd had during my career um, particularly when I 
did something called JC, which is actually an accreditation standard, which of course had existed just for adults. And I said, no, this is outrageous. We need a special one for children because children are not mini adults, they are children. And that's very important. So that was super and great fun. But the hysterical thing about all of this is that at the end of this fesh shrift, all of my colleagues disappeared and they returned five minutes later, all dressed as me. So that even the men were wearing pashminas and, and silk scarves and the, the girls were dressed up in furs. And, you know, one of them said to me, I had to ask my daughter some heels because I don't have any heels like you. It was just so lovely and so sweet of them. And, and they, too, remain very close friends because we've been through a lot together. We faced all those challenges and we've conquered as many as it was possible to conquer. But there's still a lot to do. Um, and you probably close friends because they still want to borrow your pashminas. We do keep coming back uh, to fashion, children, um, health, physical, mental health. All of this is your is your true passion and 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 why you've received this community award. Um, but Jackie, you do you do love your fashion, don't you? And I have to say, I'm so sorry to be here with a mug tonight, but I just thought rather than coughing but look there's pink pink flowers on it in your in your honor so tell us a little bit about your love of fashion well i don't know i guess it came originally from my mother who is a very vibrant mediterranean lady um who who said to me she's darling presentation is everything you know you must never go out without your nails polished and looking good it really really matters and and just remember when you're putting face cream on at night put twice as much cream on your neck as you do on your face, because this is critically important. So at the same time as she was telling me all of this, my father was saying, you get yourself a career, my girl, it'll never let you down. So he's quite right in many ways. But actually, the love of fashion continued. And I, you know, I, I, I just I just love fashion. In fact, hysterically, during lockdown, or now at the end of lockdown, my favourite shops in Bond Street have started ringing me up and sending me pictures of their new collection. So clearly, I've got to get back up there and, and see what they've got. So, so now I just love it. And yes, I have to say still, even at this age, pink is a favorite color. So I was about to say as part of your community award, you have to do something for the national economy. So get, get thee to Bond Street, uh, uh, Jackie. Um, finally, before we get to um, questions, which will hopefully, have, you wanted to talk about the people around you that have helped you towards all of these um, achievements in your life. And I think that's one, of the many uh, remarkable things about you is that you are you're very humble because you know when when we chatted also you kept saying my amazing colleagues my amazing family my you know so the floor is open to you to talk to those people now thank you well it, well of course i i must say thanks to them i must say thanks particularly to my mentors um sir ron kerr who was my chief executive in bristol at a time and then he moved up to london and is one of the greatest people in the nhs ever absolutely fantastic um professor sir john goldman who sadly has died now but he was the professor of hematology at the hammersmith hospital and every meeting i met him at he used to say to me jackie you've got to get on and publish that data I used to say, we haven't had enough, John, yet. He said, no, 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 publish the first and then publish a second series and then publish again. So we did, and he, he was fabulous. There were, there were many other people who actually supported me and believed in me. People on the University of Bristol um, Council, actually, loads of people who supported me, I'm sure, towards getting the honorary doctorate. But, but all, my, all my local colleagues who've been completely wonderful, who all were at the end of the phone, you know, when I needed something on parliamentary questions, all these wonderful, dedicated professionals, the fabulous management staff I worked with, lovely people in NHS England, my clinical colleagues, national directors in NHS England, all my girlfriends with whom I share this huge passion about fashion and, and everything we sort of, you know, love and enjoy together and who support me with phone calls and lots of bouts of hilarity. They're lovely. I just couldn't do without them. But of course, who I must truly say thank you to is my family. You know, my I've got two super boys. One of them is, is a doctor. The other one's a lawyer. The lawyer is married to a doctor who is also a very fabulous and very bright lady, an infectious disease consultant at the Royal Free Hospital. And I have three grandchildren who are just fantastic. But I, but I have to give a huge and special thanks to my husband who has supported me 
through thick and thin. He's a colonial, so he didn't expect, a French colonial, that when he married me, I'd be racing off to pursue my career. He thought I'd be mostly looking after him. Well, that took about five minutes and then I was off again. So he's been very, very tolerant of that. He, you know, like, like my two boys, they are my greatest support, but in many ways, my sternest, critic, sternest uh, critics, you know, my, my sons will obviously think that I'm going a bit off piece from time to time and pull me back into line again. Um, but, but they're always so supportive and so wonderful that I just, you know, I appear really by courtesy of all of them. And I, I think sort of finally to, to finish off, there are a couple of slides of what I suppose what I've lived by in my professional life um, when things have got tough. And that's, I think, not that slide, the one with Winston Churchill, maybe. That's right, yes. When things get tough, I sort of look at that and Winston Churchill saying, never, never, never give up. And I think that's something, that's an object lesson for everybody. And also something which took me through all of my jobs. My great, my elder son, Dominic, adored Winnie the Pooh and we all adore Winnie the Pooh. And he said, most memorably, you can't stay in your corner of the forest waiting for the others to come to you you have to go to them sometimes. In other words, you can't sit down and think, well, why are things not happening? You've got to get up and go to them. That's what it's all about. And I think my final slide says it all when it comes to children and young people. And this was a very, very wise man, Frederick Douglass, who came out of slavery and said wonderfully, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And how true is that? And how much of a mantra is that for us, all my colleagues, everybody who works in children's services, to actually keep on doing the very best we can so that these children that we're looking after will grow into strong men and women. <laughs> well, amen to that, absolutely, to you and your colleagues. Again, a, a, a huge congratulations, not just from me, of course, you received your uh, award from the University of Bristol and everybody watching you uh, this evening I will feel exactly the same. We've had a very interesting top question for you. This is the most popular question so far. Um, you're inspirational for what you've done, but if you hadn't gone into medicine and the medical profession, people would like to know what you would have chosen as your career. I'd have been a lawyer, actually. That's, oh. it, was, it was a big sort of decision, one or the other. Uh, and obviously I'd have become a barrister and I'd have gone to court because where else can you actually be paid to wear black all day? So apart from wearing pink, my sort of work outfit is mostly black. But you know, there's this always this wonderful interchange of sheer disrespect between doctors and lawyers. And, and, and yes, interestingly, so many friends of my lawyers and my husband's father was a, was a judge. He was the chief justice in, in Mauritius. So interesting too that of my two boys one became a doctor one became a lawyer so you know it's interesting isn't it how that works out apart from that i you know i gave up ballet dancing to do to do medicine so that that could have been a career but not certainly for as long as medicine i my body wouldn't have held out for that long i don't think so i gave up i gave up ballet hence the love of the pink tutus to actually to do medicine which has given me a longer career than ballet would have done and I'm just interested, what area of law would you have wanted to practice? So what's, what part of law would have fascinated you most, do you think? Um, well, do you know, inevitably, I think it would have been family law, probably. Um, mm. Because there is, particularly having worked so closely in many ways with the legal profession and the Ministry of Justice and all that sort of thing within NHS England, I, I developed such a sort of passion for understanding what the basis and if it was logical to so many of the decisions we had to deal with, because we always approach things with a passion, whereas lawyers will approach things with a lot more logic. Now, my husband once accused me of not being very high in logic, so I'm sort of smarting from that slightly. But it's, it's, a, it's an interesting approach, isn't it? And I, I think I, I have many sort of, you know, heroes, I guess, and, and heroines and friends within the legal profession who have followed family law. Another thing I guess I was quite interested in, and there again might have been because my, my father-in-law was, was criminal law, and that's sort of from one extreme to the other, really. Um, 
And that there again, I think because it brings the mental health element into it, which has become such a an interest and a passion of mine now. So, you know, there's a there's a level of um, query about that and, and why people actually sort of, you know, go into the dark side and become criminals, although that is far too trite a, a summation. But but nonetheless, I think I think I might have been interested. But I think probably the most the most the area I would have found the most interest would have been children's family. Well, can we stay with um, mental health again? Because the, the, you mentioned again, because we have a question from uh, a GP who says, uh, we've noticed a huge surge in mental health issues in our teenage population in the last few months. Do you think there will be increased support to account for what has gone on during COVID? Yes. Um, yes, there, there will be increased support. In fact, I, I know that, that the one of the mitigating actions about the, the big increase, so the presentations have increased. There's been a rise in eating disorders, particularly in sort of young girls. There's been a 50% increase in admissions, children who've required admission for their mental health disorder. And that has really challenged NHS England because um, as, as I'm sure the GP who's inquiring will know, there aren't that many. We're not very well endowed for what used to be called tier four beds for children. Uh, and children themselves and young people will actually say that their mental health has deteriorated either considerably or very considerably. But I do know that in terms of mitigating actions, there has been extra money identified for support to bring children forward, to actually encourage referrals. I don't know exactly how it's going to be metered out, but I had this news centrally from NHS England that more funding was going to be forthcoming. And I hope we'll see that trickle down into primary care and the communities. One must recognise, of course, that mental health is not just uh, a health issue. It's education, it's social care. It, it's a sort of vast array of bodies who together can make a difference to children's mental health. As you highlighted earlier, very clearly, um, the huge factor um, played by social inequality, which, of course, um, has has surfaced so starkly the differences um, during COVID, not just in the UK, but uh, uh, everywhere. Uh, we have a, a, um, another question for you, which is interesting because we, we've talked a lot this evening about passion, your passion, your colleague's passion. So this question is, how do you stay focused, uh, Jackie, if you're faced with um, trying and emotional situations with patients? Yes, that's, that, now that's, that was a really difficult one. And that's something that you have to learn, particularly when working with children with cancer and leukemia. And I think the most important thing about that is to work very hard, because I always start with the parents to to bring them on side, to sort of bring them together with you so that we're all speaking the same language and they will understand that I will be absolutely clear and straightforward with them and I will tell them the truth. With their young child, the communication will be at an age appropriate level. So with teenagers, you can of course bring them more into the conversation and they will ask more and you will reply to them most truthfully. But, but yes, it's very emotional and I think, you know, the most important thing is not being afraid to show to show parents that you care. I think that's critically important because you don't go in there really tough, deliver it as it is and then go away again. And I learned this lesson when I was doing a consultation once with, a, with an adult colleague. This was on a young man who was 16, so kind of on the cusp, really. And my adult colleague went in really hard saying, this and this and this is going to happen and this is the chance of success. I was absolutely horrified. And when I saw him on my own, I sort of softened it around the corner because what it is not in our gift to do is take away hope, not as a physician ever. You know, that, that, that's not in our power. What you must do is give hope and give support. And I think those are the most critically important things I learned. And to be able to, as I say, show emotion with them, put an arm around them, really show that you absolutely care. And I guess having done that is the reason why, sadly, or gratifyingly, I don't know, because of course I lost many of my patients. So many of the parents asked me if I would speak at their funerals. My European colleagues were absolutely stunned and astounded at this and said that they never, never did that. But I had known 
the whole family, the siblings, the parents, the child who had succumbed, you know, grandparents, everybody for such a long time and been through so much with them together that it seemed such an abrupt cut off to say, well, sorry, you know, in the end, this this didn't work and we lost your child. But actually, yes, I always did it whenever they asked me. And it was hard. It was tough. But it was something that I did because I felt it was just the right thing to do. And I keep in touch with parents even now. Jackie, can I can I ask you then? I mean, since you you go so above and beyond, and and actually within the medical profession, there are so many individuals who who do that. And I think the general public has become much more aware of this during the COVID crisis, even though that valiant sort of service to the community has been going on all along, even before COVID, as as you well know. But how do you deal with it when you go home? You know, that famous thing of work-life balance. If you're actually going to patients' funerals and you have that close bond with a family and, you know, these are children, how do you survive with that? And how do you leave it at the door to be home for your children, if you don't mind me asking? Yes. Well, of course, you can't quite leave it at the door because you can't switch off feelings. But, but actually then being involved in your family life is something that that takes you into a world which of course means such a lot for you and 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 that's what i found could you know could get me through the really difficult times sometimes i used to come home and i'd had a really sort of difficult time at the hospital with with some patients and families and some a lot of emotions and i would just arrive on the doorstep and burst into tears and and this is when my husband and family were so fantastic. And my husband used to deal with it by saying, um, Tottenham's on the box. Do you want to come and watch them? <laughs> if there's anything that'll dry tears, it's being told that Tottenham Hotspur are on the box. And do I want to watch them? Because no, of course I don't. And that sort of therefore gets me into a different frame of mind. And I can start sort of cooking supper and getting ready and doing the flowers. So that's how I coped. But, you know, sort of many years ago in, in my desk downstairs, when I had one downstairs, I had what I called the memory drawer. And in this drawer, I kept pictures of children that, that we had lost because actually they, in many ways, were the motivation to keep going, to, to, to know that we had to understand more, we had to research more, we had to develop more. It wasn't until you get to a stage that, you know, you're curing virtually every child, then you've done your job. That's certainly not going to be within my lifetime. But I tell you, one had to be feeling, I had to be feeling pretty strong to open that drawer and remember them. Beautiful photographs that their parents gave me that, that I remembered those very special children by. So your motivation is not just those beautiful ones I showed right at the front who survived, but the ones who didn't survive as well and remembering them and remembering their stories. Oh, <laughs> I am... Um... <laughs> We're running out of time, even though I, you know, I know I'm, I won't be alone in wanting to, to, to really just keep on talking to you. Um, there is a, a complicated question, and unfortunately, we need a relatively quick answer. I don't know if, 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 if there is one, but the question is, what is it about deprivation that translates into, into info, infant mortality? I mean, it, which health conditions lead to the increased infant deaths that aren't seen in similar European countries? That's the question with very little time to answer. I'm so sorry. Oh, my goodness. Well, that, that's a, a very, very complicated one to unpack, because if you just look, you know, if you take perhaps maternal health. So in maternal health, in areas of high deprivation, because the maternal health is going to determine the health of the child, you may have issues with um debt, with obesity, uh, with smoking, you know, and smoking is the biggest thing that we have to stop when it comes to preventing stillbirths, premature births, all that sort of thing. So smoking, obesity, teenage pregnancy, substance abuse, um, the capability to access healthcare, to know that you can get healthcare and where you can find it, um, to, to, to instigate safe practices at home, to have good nutrition, because poor nutrition doesn't benefit sort of the mother or the family or anything. And, and to actually sort out sort of women's mental health when they're pregnant as well. That I know is just concentrating on the woman, but that is the start of everything for children. And that those things, that, that poverty and inequality are the very start of a child's life 
even sort of preconception before the child is ever conceived, the state of health of the mother and family, which will lead to the sort of worst outcomes for children. There's a lot of sort of politics packed up in that, but there's a lot of health too, making healthcare better to support people in the areas of deprivation that we know do less well. I know that everybody watching this evening will be giving you a round of applause, applause for being such a well-deserving winner of this community award um, from the University of Bristol. And just for being so, I can't, so I'm gonna use a naughty word, extremely impressive and a delight to chat to um, Dr. Jackie Cornish. Thank you very, very much indeed for inspiring all of us um, this evening, a, a true, true, pleasure in pink or or otherwise <laughs> we've got to go so i'm just going to say we've got the results of the poll um so we asked you what do you connect most to most strongly from your time at bristol uh so we've got 46 percent of you saying the course uh 40 saying the city itself that's huge um for bristol sports teams seven percent societies five percent and halls two percent thank you so much uh, for answering the poll um there is a comment section um that uh, that where you can provide some feedback for this evening's event um and make sure that you sign up for the next festival event, Thursday the 20th of May, with a chat with Paul Lindley, OBE. Um, make sure that you're present for that one because uh, that'll be fantastic uh, as well. Thank you for joining us um, this evening. Have a wonderful rest of the day. You might, it may not be evening uh, where you are. Thank you to the University of Bristol and to me and well done, uh, Dr. Jackie Cornish. You are a true inspiration. Thank you.